Welcome again to another episode of the Southwest Climate Podcast. As always, the indomitable Mike Crimmins. Zach, how are you doing? How's your mosquito bites? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're still everywhere. I know. Um, I actually don't even go out on my porch anymore. I, we, we can't go outside. I, I'll let you know that I am being bitten right now, standing here talking to you inside my house. It is uh, maybe the, the the biggest drawback to the monsoon, uh, unfortunately. It's um, worth but you know it. what? I'm happy to make that trade. I'm going to worth it. it. Yeah, I totally. Mosquitoes I'm, are like one of the few things that I think in the, the, this world could do without. But even even with that, I wouldn't trade um, last year for this year. Oh, totally. Oh. So when we do get outside in the evening, if you can brave it, you can watch the bats fly around and they're just like lethargic because they're so fat. <laughs> they just can't even, they're like, oh, not another one. I can't even. Oh, do we that. need a bat index. We do need a bat index. <laughs> How fast they're, they're flying and their, their body mass index. Yeah, that, that correlates well. Well, it's good to see you on Zoom again. And uh, I'm happy to say that this is another, I think, uh, fun episode because we're still in, in the midst of the monsoon season. And, uh, you know, when we last did this, Mike, I think uh, mid-August, I don't remember the exact date. Uh, in fact, I don't even know what date it is today. We, all <laughs> these days sort of blend together, but it was about a month ago. And uh, at that time, we were still in the throes, the really tight grip of the, of the monsoon, a generational monsoon, as we were calling it which I'd still argue holds up, but uh, certainly the last month hasn't kept pace. And it couldn't, it really couldn't, but it's been of a different flavor. And so we have a lot to talk about just in the last month. We'll, we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about and putting the last two months in context. And then, you know, we sort of want to ask the question, or I sort of want to ask the question of whether or not the monsoon is over. Uh, that and sounds good. You know, I got to <laughs> give you full credit too for generational. I've been seeing that pop up in the media <laughs> across the southwest and that is that is you my friend i know That's it is good. pretty funny i've seen it i've seen it too it's catchy it's catchy but 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 it's also it's also real and i think like it's generational right like we're not like exaggerating i'm not saying it's millennial or it's not a <laughs> mega monsoon whatever that means you know this a generational it's you know one in what what's it what's a generation one in 25 yeah, I think that's right. One in yeah. 50. I mean, you can make some arguments. And we did last last episode for Tucson. This wasn't everywhere, but for Tucson, it was a, it was a wet. We hadn't ex- experienced a July or a month with that much rain ever. So in that sense, it was historical. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this. But when you lump in August uh, for Tucson, it's, it's, it's more like a generational. Completely with you on that. And I think that it, <laughs> this monsoon walloped the population centers in Arizona. And so I think that there's this sort of shared experience going on here. But as you pointed out, it wasn't, it wasn't crazy everywhere. It was good in a lot of places. And then, you know, across New Mexico had a little bit different flavor, flavor as well. Let's, let's talk about August or, or the last month, if you will. But just a little bit of context for Tucson. July was, you know, the, the wettest at the airport. July was the wettest month on record it for was. Tucson. That's- that's right. Yep. But it was also broadly across basically all of Arizona wetter than average and in some places, you know, more than 200% of, of, of average. So July was vigorous monsoon for Arizona and maybe a little bit more spotty in New Mexico, but the core monsoon re- region, at least in the U.S., was a very robust July, unlike anything that I had experienced while living here. And then also when you go back into the data, some metrics had Arizona, when you aggregate it, ag- average it across the state was, was something like the, just the second wettest, just was the second wettest in the last 120 years. So it wasn't, wasn't the wettest according to that measure. But anyway, my point is July, 
uh, a soaker and uh, uh, like something that many of us hadn't hadn't seen before. Just going to throw in there that it was 8.06 inches in Tucson. That's right. Eight, in July. Just over eight inches at <clears throat> yeah, the airport. And that, right. And that eclipsed the old record of 2017. Your previous favorite year, a uh, favorite July was 6.8 inches in Tucson. Yeah, it eclipsed it. It, it, it shattered it. But, but also, we might have mentioned this before, but it's worth noting again. Um, that 2017, like the airport itself was sort of like the bullseye of all yeah. the wet, of all the showers. Like it was one of the wetter. So in Tucson, the flood control district has about 124 automatic recording stations across, across the metro area. So that's quite a bit. And so you get a, a relatively high resolution, spatial, spatial resolution. Uh, 2017, the airport was on the higher side. This year, it was kind of in the middle. I mean, and when you look at the 128 stations, more of them were, were wetter than 2017. So, so 2021 not only eclipsed 2017 at the airport, but across the metro area. And that holds also for, for other areas, although uh, we don't have as, as great a resolution, obviously, for, for, for non-metro areas. I'll take that, as, I'll take that silence as, as a nod. You know, is nodding, which is not a useful um, activity during a podcast. It's worth mentioning that just to, to put a little bit of uh, this July in, in, in context. But we did much of that last podcast. So August. August was really interesting. It wasn't immediately obvious to me uh, because I think my, my perception of the monsoon had been so colored by July that I had just and, and and honestly like the early part of august kept up the july vigor right but that changed uh, and and when you look at the sort of spatial distribution it was really a tale of of the southwest to southwest like basically mogollon rim south southern half of arizona and for for that matter southern half of new mexico was wetter than average uh whereas the northern regions uh, were drier than average in some places, much drier than average. So we had the persistence in August on average, keeping up uh, uh, the persistent wet conditions, keeping up in August for the Southern half and drying in the Northern half. And I think that's the biggest pattern that comes through so far in the monsoon in, in August. What created this pattern? Like why, why do we have this two, uh, two halves? I think that building the story from the beginning of the monsoon in July and then kind of carrying it through does help highlight some of those differences. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at some just daily precip maps through July and it was still just kind of stunned at, you know, we got into late June and into early part of July and we were getting rain every day across, you know, some part of Arizona, New Mexico, and then it kind of grew. And then we'd have these pulses of big days and then they'd kind of retreat, but it was still raining pretty consistently once we got past the big event in late July that really hammered much of Arizona and New Mexico, it slowed down. And so that first week of August, it started to wind down. And then we got into right about August 5th through probably the 10th. So a good solid period there that the dew points started to retreat a little bit, fall and um, the moisture retreated south. We had a little shift in the ridge pattern. Um, and we started to get some pressure from the north. So those troughs that were not really present much uh, in July started to kind of show their presence across the west. And so then the ridge started to get suppressed back to the south. And that's what we saw all last summer. And now we had a, you know, a period of a couple of days now where that slowed everything down. It didn't shut everything down and it wasn't the end of the monsoon. And you know, when we recorded the podcast, which I can't remember what day it was either, but coming out of July, you're just like, it cannot keep up this pace, right? You can't, it can't have hustle like this for the whole season. So I was really surprised that we did end up having a couple of very wet periods for the central and southern part of the state emerge with, with severe weather and some pretty heavy flooding in parts of the state from about the middle of August through the third week slowed down again around August uh, 20th. And it wasn't until we ended up having um, uh, Tropical Storm Nora 
across the southern edge of the Gulf that we got another good slug of moisture up here, which set us up for some more widespread precipitation. So, so August really had two distinct breaks in it, um, which again are normal parts of the monsoon. We just didn't see them early on. Big wet period in the middle with some severe weather, and then that Nora precipitation, which did end up raining on the northern part of the state a bit more um, later in the month. But I didn't answer your question, which is what's the pattern? The ridge really never built back to its extent like we saw in July, where it kind of gave us equal opportunity across the state. The moisture really pooled in the low deserts. And so some of the heaviest precipitation that fell in August was not in the kind of Mogollon Rim or the high country, which we normally see with the afternoon convection. It was low desert, you know, flooding in Phoenix, flooding in Gila Bend with some fatalities and some damage and uh, flooding some uh, across some of the parts of uh, the southern parts of the state too. Yeah, so I, I, I want to put a data point here, courtesy of our friend from the National Weather Service in Phoenix office, uh, Paul Inez. He cued us into the fact that since 2007, when storm-based warnings or some storm-based warning era at the National Weather Service began, just six times did a weather forecast office issue more than 100 flash flood warnings in a single month. And one of them, one of those six times was in August in Phoenix. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it is really amazing. And it's unsurprising that two other of those six times were in July, one in Phoenix and one in Flag Flagstaff. So we're, we're well represented in a, in a bad way with flash flood warnings. But to, back to your point. So it seems like the ridge position really won out in July and it was, was able to maintain its sort of favorable position to the north of of Southern Arizona and, and allow that moisture seep in from, from, from the South. And that, that ridge was more knocked around by, I guess, you know, one could say that the, the, the sort of the higher latitude atmospheric flow sort of beat it down a little bit and was able to knock it, knock it South. I mean, is that a, is that the right way to think about it? That there's this, there's always this sort of tension between forcings from the South pushing, you know, the, 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 the heat, uh, and the uh, and the heating of the continent pushing the the position of the ridge north, but also these higher latitude forcing sort of influencing the position of the jet stream and the and its curvature and uh, from the north. Yeah, we were talking with Paul on Slack about this. He had noticed, and and I pulled up some correlations too that. There's an interesting correlation between the Arctic Oscillation, which is something we typically think about in the winter time, right? And it's related to North Atlantic Oscillation and the, the winter storm track. Um, it was interesting. This year, the Arctic Oscillation in July was very positive. So that gives you an indication that the mid-latitude jet is pretty tight up north, and it's going to be at its, its most northerly displaced um, location in the summertime, right? So it also gives you a sense that there's not going to be a lot of wave activity in the mid-latitudes and as you get into the subtropics, you know, kind of where we're at, right, as well. So I think that that really helps that the large subtropical ridges just had plenty of place to, to move out and expand and just kind of grow. And that is ideal situation. We see some of our wet Julys in the past actually have similar patterns, like 1955 has a, has a pretty similar positive NAO. It's not perfect every year, and this correlation is not, it's not one, but it was an interesting thing to kind of to poke at. As you get into August, it gets a little bit noisier, right? And, the, and for whatever reason, it got more weathery in the Northern Hemisphere, and whatever's going on upstream we started to see more of that wave activity come across the West. And I think it's pretty normal for the ridge to, to build and um, get knocked around a little bit and build and get moved around with that wave pattern. And so through the, the beginning of the month, we saw the ridge kind of get shoved off towards the Northwest. And then we saw it rebuild again. We got, and it rebuilt to a point where we actually had an inverted trough come through the middle of the month, which really helped support that widespread precipitation. We had the moisture, gave us the instability, and it also gave us the shear, which is going to be that wind speed to, to really move the storms that were forming off of uh, the Mogollon Rim out into the low deserts, and then move out into the low deserts and have and just interact with all of that moisture. And then 
the ridge really retreated towards the third in the last week of the month. So we were actually kind of in a trough. So we we're, we're into that transition period. And then you started to see some kind of transition events where now the storms are, um, if they're able to, and they've got some moisture, they're going to, they're going to interact with that favorable environment. That's going to be a little bit better lapse rates, you know, enhancing the Cape, but you're also fighting against drying air with the, um, the trough and the storms are now moving from the Southwest to the Northeast. So you don't have the topography then to really initiate the convection and that kind of stuff. So it, it kind of dried out. So it's a little bit of transition. So then we really had to wait for the ridge to get in the right position again and the moisture to come back with Nora at the end of the month to give us our next shot. And now, you know, we're into September, we're like a week and a half in and the ridge is kind of where you'd see it in June. It's more overhead. It's not real favorable for transporting moisture in and it's the forecast anyways has a sort of sagging south. So to me, I think I'm jumping the gun on your, your question for later, Zach, but is like, is it over? It's starting to feel like it. Well, that was a lot, man. Easy, hopefully, easy. hopefully Ben's going to edit that into some bite-sized chunks. <laughs> no, that was really good. I mean, you said so many different things in there that uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a little bit of that at a, at a time. Uh, first, it. Yeah. first off is you, you have these event, these transition events, which is basically like these, um, the jet stream is 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 more typically what you would you you'd think about in sort of October and late September October and it's sort of coming down from uh, the Pacific Northwest area and it can bring moisture with it. But the other thing that it can do if there is moisture present is you need some dynamics uh, associated to also sort of create that uplift and that convection. And so so it's not necessarily the death toll of of monsoon storms. In fact, it can on the leading edge, right? It can create sort of favorable environments, but the, the tension is that those storms that come down or the flow that comes down because they're coming from higher latitudes coming across a long continental reach are just drier. And so, so you're, you're just bringing with it less moisture. And so if you have moisture around, which we did initially, the dynamics are favorable, but it doesn't last long and uh, without needing that ridge to sort of push further north again and allow the southerly flow into the state. I guess the, the one question is, is did we, so you mentioned sort of like August, you can think of August as the first part of it was drier, the middle part was wetter and the, and, and the, and the, and the last third was, was, was drier. Did the middle part you sort of explained as being more, the, the ridge was in a more northerly position. So we had that moisture around, but and then the other two periods were more sort of transition like, and it seems like we didn't get the kinds of storms that we could have if, if the dynamics won out. Did the dynamics with those transition storms not really create the storms that maybe they could have? Those transition type events can be really, really wet. We know this from previous research and there's some research that we're, we're trying to do in the background here where we we see this show up in the historical record too, is where if you have an advancing trough and it's got a real deep southerly flow ahead of it, and if there's a tropical storm, it's even better, right? So you've got sort of deep moisture flowing in, then it can, it just fills up the whole Southwest with deep moisture. And then those dynamics can usually support widespread heavy precipitation, right? And so th that's kind of ideal it's really convergence of those two things. And we didn't really see that. So some of the heaviest precip events occurred with actually the inverted trough moving from east to west. And that was sort of the middle of the month, right? That was middle first. of August. Yeah. yeah. Middle of August. But then just a couple of days later, we had a trough of approach into that same moisture and then it kind of flipped it around. And then you ended up having, okay, that was supporting thunderstorms that were then moving the other direction. Right. So the first, storms were moving into the low desert and just hammering low desert. And then the whole circulation pattern flips around and then you've got a trough moving in and the, and the upper level winds are switching around to the Southwest. And they're now helping aiding and abetting these storm formation on the high country now that's then moving them off to the Southwest. So it was kind of an interesting interplay between these East moving storms. And then, you know, days later there were West moving storms and that's they both. That's can be, awesome. I love that. Yeah, it was super interesting. I'm like staring at the 
the daily weather maps right now, just kind of like trying to piece together um, what happened. And there, and part of this, what cued me to this was that uh, you mentioned Paul earlier with the, the Phoenix Weather Service office, but I was looking at the storm. They have four storm summaries for different, these big different events in that wet period in the middle of August. And they all have just sort of subtle dynamics and subtle impacts associated with it. And, and some of this too, just to make sure, <laughs> forget our friends in New Mexico, some of this, this activity did reach into New Mexico as well and was part of this, um, this wet period. So one other thing about that pattern, about that, the, the two halves, the wet south and the drier north, how much should we believe, like I'm looking at maps now and, you know, we've got these graded data and we, we know that large swaths of northern Arizona, particularly north uh, eastern Arizona, doesn't have a lot of coverage, right? Like it's not as well instrumented. So Mike, do we believe, do you believe like the that it's really dry up there. And what have you heard? Because you're, you know, you, you get out and you actually talk to people. Well, I don't leave my house anymore. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's that. So I, I live through the internet and if, if the data's online, it's real to me. Um, <laughs> oh, but I, I was really interested in this as well because it does look pretty dry, but I was poking around at some different data sets and over the last 30 days across the northern part of the state, it's kind of a mixed bag. So there are some sites that, given the, the character of the storms, did end up getting some pretty heavy precipitation. Like um, and but this is also too, is that some of these are pretty remote sites and they're automated sites, and we're not, you know, totally sure on the the, the quality of the data. I'm looking at a Raw site um, that's up near the Grand Canyon. So over the last 30 days, this Raw site saw three and a half inches and it should in, in August, it normally sees about two. So that puts it at the 94th percentile for August. So it's pretty wet. And this is a raw site. And so there's a nearby site, which is at the Grand Canyon entrance that got about half an inch of rain. And so that site normally sees about one and a half inches. So that's, those are really close to each other. It's very possible that raw site got clobbered by a localized storm, but there's quite a few gauges around it that are pretty dry for August. You, that's a good point you bring up. And that's kind of why I raised this question. It, it, in part, the, the monsoon is so challenging because of its spatial heterogeneity. And just giving, given that these areas don't have a lot of ground truthing, um, you can get perhaps the wrong picture off of just a few stations, you know, but there are, there is satellite stuff that people look at and, 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 and talking to people and ranchers up there, which I guess you don't do anymore sitting in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do more, more remotely at this point. Yeah. yeah. Can really help fill in the, the sort of holes in, in, in the data. You know, these graded data are made from station data, right? So as you're pointing out, they're only as good as the station data. And oftentimes they don't have all of the station data we have available to us. It wasn't a complete failure, it looks like, across the northern part of the state, but it was a bit drier than you'd normally see in August. And remember, August is a high bar. August is typically our wettest month of the monsoon, and often it's the wettest month the entire year for some of these locations. So we only have some pockets that are much below normal to, to record driest, and they're pretty isolated. So it still did rain across the northern part of the state, but it just it just doesn't compare to what some of those lower desert sites saw this past month. You know, I don't know if you were kind of watching, but some of these, these precip totals, you know, down around Gila Bend, and it, it went all the way out to Yuma and then went into the deep desert of, of California, just epic, you know, precipitation, you know, four or five inches in a day with some of these storms, you know, just really, really impressive for these areas that don't, you know, most of them don't get three inches on average in a year. And we're clocking four or five inches in a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah. I saw some of those. I mean, they're, they're, they're impressive. They're impressive looking. They're impressive looking virtually on in the data, on the radars, and they can do quite a bit of damage. Um, Absolutely. Just, just to your point about uh, the Northern part that it, 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 it did rain up there. I, I pulled two, maybe not as much as it, it has in the Southern portions and maybe not as much as average, but it, it wasn't, wasn't last year. You probably have this a little better at the ready too, but I was looking at Albuquerque, you know, which we were a little worried about 
um, middle of last month because it had kind of slowed down. You know, pretty good rain kept pace slightly above average by the end of July. It didn't not rain in Albuquerque in August, but it wasn't it wasn't epic, right? I mean, they ended up having a handful of rain events. None of them amounted to much. You know, any, anything from like maybe at most less than half an inch to you know a couple of tenth inch days. And so, you know, by the end of August, Albuquerque is now not quite um, meeting average precipitation. And it looks really likely at this point that they're going to end up below average for the whole monsoon season. Yeah. Let me do the roundup around, around these cities in a minute, but just to put the fine final point on the drier North Northern area, I just looked at two stations that have very long records. They're part of NOAA's U S historical climate network, which are chosen based on the longevity and they've done some pretty high bar quality control on them. They're, they're, they're few and far between, which is why it makes it problematic for the monsoon season, but nonetheless, they're, they're, they're long records. So I looked at Canyon de Chez, which I always want to say is Canyon de Shelley. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> Come on, get your French on. <laughs> uh, and Holbrook. So Holbrook, August for Holbrook saw about an inch and a quarter of rain which was, according to this record, about 75% of average. So, you know, it's close enough. I mean, it got some rain and and it was sort of middle of the distribution in terms of like its rank out of 127 years uh, in this data set. You know, and Canyon de Chez was about an inch or or 70% of average. And again, sort of like sort of on in the middle of the distribution in, in, in terms of rank. So dry, below average, but some, some rain. You know, I think when you combine that with uh, July, you still get a sort of uh, a favorable uh, picture. And so let me let's transition now and just to to think about both of these months back to back, because I really think this is how we're going to evaluate the monsoon and uh, and not such on the the week to week basis. But when you um, when you combine these. The NOAA uh, rankings, they don't allow you to do two months. So you have to do June, July, and August. June didn't, we didn't see much rain in June. I, so I'm just going to say that Ju- June was near average and sort of is inconsequential to the ranking. Um, Mike, you can disagree with me if you want on that. But no, I, I'm at, nodding again. I'm agreeing. Okay. Yeah. June, July, and August for the totality of, of Arizona, it comes in at 121 of 127. So what does that make that? Six on, uh, six wettest on record? Yeah, six wettest on record, I've got to count. I, I mean, generational, I'm sticking with the narrative, Mike. I'm with you. I think, again, it, de- it depends on... I guess it would be a one in 20 year event then. Yeah. Um, I, I, if I, we I, did it by probabilities. Right, I, you know, and I think that there have been there have definitely been monsoons in the last 20 years, though, where locally, uh, in different parts of the Southwest, it has been way wetter, right? So I think for you and I to see something like we saw in Tucson again, is it's probably a long time coming, um, unless climate change has changed, <laughs> changed everything about, about right, the, put, the frequencies. Let me put a finer part. point on that, because okay. I have the numbers here. And I was just looking at the five cities, the, the kinds of cities that we uh, we often talk about Tucson, Flagstaff, Phoenix, Albuquerque, and, and, and Las Cruces. Um, and so this is treating the rankings as if the monsoon season was over. So the, the numbers that I give off would not get any worse, would, would only go up from here, but it gives you a picture of if, if we got no more rain at these cities for the remainder of September, this is what the ranking would be. Uh, and I think this gives you a picture of just a sort of heterogeneity across across the Southwest. So as you said, yeah, Tucson so far has been the third wettest in 74 years. Right now we're at 12.8 inches. Do I'm doing that off of memory? Might correct me if I'm wrong. 12.8 inches or 12, somewhere around there with the record being 13.9 uh, inches. At, and so... Uh, we'll talk about whether or not we think it's going to be broken. But first of all, 12.8 inches is obscene for Tucson. But it, it ranks three out of 74. Phoenix, 13 out of 74. So it's above average, obviously. 
Flagstaff, 11 out of 73. And then you go to sort of New Mexico, it's a little bit of a different story. Albuquerque is um, below average and ranking 105 out of 131 data points. And Las Cruces is a little bit below average, ranking 76 out of 131 data points. So yeah, there's quite a bit of, of heterogeneity across the Southwest with Tucson, woohoo, uh, coming in at sort of sort of uh, leading the charge here. Uh, let me let me correct, not 12.8, but 12.4 at at, at uh, Tucson uh, Airport. 12.41. 12.41. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I'm nodding again. Does that help? It does help. Um, okay, good. <laughs> so is there anything else, Mike, that you want to say in terms of either like the sort of interesting patterns that you've seen either in August or July and August together? Uh, and just in terms of putting this, uh, this season so far in, in context? Yeah, maybe this help us segue a little bit, but as you know, I've brought this up a couple of times. I'm kind of obsessed with 1955 as an analog. And I'm just struck by how similar the evolution of the monsoon seasons were in, and it really, it came out because 1955 for, for Tucson is the second wettest. And so we're on the heels of that one right now. And 1964 is the wettest. And 1964 is actually a completely different year in the accumulation of precip down here in Tucson. So 1955 ended, ended up having a super strong July uh, as far as precipitation, and we beat it out. And then had a pretty strong August. And then the precip was done by the end of August, and it was a very dry September across the Southwest in 1955. And a couple of, and again, it wasn't, if you look at 1955, it wasn't wet everywhere. It was wet across the low deserts. It was a bit drier up across the four corners and into New Mexico. And 1955 was sandwiched between a double dip La Nina event. So very, very similar to what we're seeing right now with a preceding La Nina winter and expected for a La Nina winter after this. And it had a, one of the driest monsoons on record uh, occurring, <laughs> I can't remember if it was preceding or after at this point, but it's, it's like our, our kind of our flip-flopping from wet to dry, dry to wet was, um, it's got a, it, it's an interesting doppelganger to kind of take a closer look at historically. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I looked at, I had a different analog year, but 1955 was one of mine. And there's a couple other similarities. First of all, it isn't just Tucson. So I also looked at uh, Phoenix and it has a lot of similarities. Again, as, as you said, September was, was dry in both Tucson and also in, in, in Phoenix. So it's a, it's a good analog in terms of the pattern of rainfall, not only for Tucson, but for Phoenix. Also, the frequency of, of, of rainfall was similar between those two years as, as well. So in Phoenix, there's been 20 days of rain this year. 1955 saw 16 days of rainfall. So a, a, a few or less in 1955. In Tucson, we've had 28 days of rainfall so far this year. Uh, in 1955, we had 25 days. So the frequency of rain and, and so far the pattern has been, has been similar. The other one that I picked out, Mike, that I'm curious to get your impressions of is 2006 something mm -hmm. a little bit uh, more recent. I don't know if that fell when you were looking at this as, as, as something similar. 2006, you know, wasn't as wet. So total for Tucson was uh, 10 and a quarter inches, had also 28 days of, uh, of, of rainfall. And we had some rain in September, but similar, s similar, similar patterns, just maybe a little bit less, less amounts. Yeah, I don't know. Did, did 2006 strike you uh, as, as a similar analog? It did early on because we, you know, 2006 kind of came up in our discussions uh, largely because the, the precip event that we had in July was timed really closely to the record precip event we had in Tucson in 2006. And so it was similar, right? So there, there was this kind of like weather scale analog about an inverted trough approaching that was going to spark some multiple days of heavy rain. And so we kind of looked at it, looked at it that way. 
outside of that, 2006 didn't have the strong start that this year did. You know, it, like we ended up having it, it had some precip early on in the month. But what I remember about that was that it really hit the gas that last week of July and in the, in the beginning of August. August was pretty, was strong. And then it kind of tailed off again as well. So just looking yeah. at the cumulative, the cumulative plots, it, it's not a perfect match. And just in the analog lookup that I've got on those plots too, it's interesting. 1921 is a pretty close match to the pattern of 2006 for, for Tucson and, two, and 1921 was at least with the, the NCDC records that we were just talking about. That's the wettest monsoon on record for the state. I'm sorry. It's the wettest July and August two month uh, period in the historical record for the whole state uh, on average. That makes sense. And looking at that temporal pattern of 2006, yeah, it's sort of, it is sort of shifted to, to as you said, it, it sort of hit the gas around late July. And then, yeah, basically there was some rainfall through, you know, the first week of, of, of September. And so if you were just to look at the, the totals and gloss your eyes over the pattern, it, 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 it's similar, but, but yeah, each, each monsoon sort of has its has uniqueness. But it just struck me that it was 1921, 2021. Have we just uncovered a hundred year cycle? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's good statistics. <laughs> <laughs> it's numerology. It's come on, man. Given that, Mike, I'm curious, like if we just sort of step back and have sort of a high level conversation, um, we've often talked about how the monsoon is, sort of brings new insights. And I'm just curious if this monsoon has made you think about things uh, in a different way or reinforce things that you thought you knew. Such a good question. You even gave me two hours to think about it. And I kept thinking about it. And I didn't come up with anything insightful. I, I think that what this monsoon, what struck me about it, and, and this is this is out of my lane, but I'm amazed at how quickly the vegetation responded going from, you know, record dry and hot summer last year with a, with another followed by a dry winter. And a lot of that vegetation was just brutalized by record heat and these record dry conditions, how much of it has bounced back. And that's, I mean, that's not to say we did, we, there was, there's noted plant mortality, but it's just amazing to see how stuff can with these conditions just bounce right back. Yeah, that's a good observation. I, I, it, it doesn't take a genius to observe just how green it's been around. Thanks, Zach. I see what you're saying. The they, South. No, no, no. But but I didn't. But I didn't actually think about it in in that way. I mean, yeah, like the particularly after the last two seasons, how much the vegetation is resilient. In other words, and you know, I'm, I'm not an ecologist, but I guess it, it it seems to be a little bit tuned up to these boomer bust cycles or may maybe not, maybe that's the wrong way to think about it, but it's just incredible how green it is. Yeah. I mean, and there's like, there's invasive species that are <laughs> clearly, clearly greening up because they're, they can take advantage of it. And, and I don't, I don't have a good sense of, you know, there's longer term mortality in some of the trees that can't be solved by a really wet season, but it, but it is just amazing. You know, I'm looking at like NDVI from satellite, the greenness, and it's just pegged and you're, you know, you're seeing low desert areas that have all this vegetation. It's just an amazing turnaround. And I'm sure it, it really stands out too, because it was so stark coming out of last summer and into last winter with very little great vegetation and loss of vegetation and burn scars everywhere. So that, that to me was, was pretty striking. So what do you think will be the lasting impacts of that? Like, and how long will those, will this persist? I, you know, I don't know. And this is, so we got to start talking to our ecology friends to get a sense of that. You know, it's like, what does this look like when it senesces? You know, what if it actually crumbles up and blows away? Or what if it is newly established vegetation? You know, like I've heard about big saguaro cacti recruitment that can happen with really wet summers like this. Can those cacti get can they be sustained, you know, do, do are the conditions next winter, next spring, next summer enough to kind of nurse them along? We had cacti grow in our yard, which I've never seen before. Like they popped up out of the rocks and I, it was just, that was amazing. I'd never seen that. 
20 years I've lived here. I actually got this question by a, uh, a news station and I, I, I couldn't answer because I'm not an ecologist, but they, but they also wanted to you know, so what's, what does this mean for the vegetation going forward? And I'm like, uh, I think my answer, like I, I, I moved it toward like water supply. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was I mean, like, well, it'll like, it'll, it could be helpful, if, you know, if the so soils remain not saturated, but have some water in it, if there's soil moisture in it, then that'll be helpful when, you know, the fall and, 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 and winter rains and snows come to being more efficient with, with, with runoff. So I didn't answer the question because I don't, I don't know the answer, but I am curious, what are sort of the lasting impacts of, of this in terms of vegetation? I do think that the pattern of precipitation, the amount and the timing, the frequency of precip this summer in, the, in some of these wettest areas, and again, it wasn't everywhere, was such that I think it actually pushed water fairly deep in the soil. So it, it might actually be available for a while for some of the deeper rooted plants, which is really quite interesting. And, and it, but I guess the flip side is, is that, you know, you and I are going to be talking about fire um, in the low desert for the next nine, 10 months until we get into right. the, next, the next fire. People season. have done good studies on this, that following wet summers in the, in the deserts, there's elevated fire risk just because there's more like the fine fuels, like there's more of it and it, it yep. doesn't take long for them to dry out. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So I have two things that I've, I've been thinking about. This first thing is so obvious, but I have to preface it by saying that like the hardest part and, and actually the most enjoyable part of like the monsoon is like trying to make sense about this phenomenon that has a tremendous amount of variability in time and in space. And when we think about like the monsoon itself is it's, it's a regional thing. And so trying to characterize the monsoon is like a very difficult thing. And you, Ben and I, you know, we, we spend an obscene amount of time talking about how to actually do this. And I don't think we've come up with like a great way because there's, there's really, you really sort of have to look at a whole bunch of different metrics and, and, and to try to explain it in a coherent, simple way. It eludes at least me at the moment. So with that, I think the monsoon is this, and we, I, I sort of argue that it's this existential phenomenon. By that, I mean, like, y you have to sort of kind of experience it. And, and we're like looking down at data and, and trying to make sense of this, but it's abstract. And until you experience it, the things that you think you know, don't have residence, uh, at least for me. And so my very simple thing that I've, I've, I've learned this year is that it really is all about the moisture. And, and I was trying to think, would the months, would this have turned out differently? Could this have turned out differently given all the monsoon uh, moisture around? Could we not have had a good monsoon season, at least in sort of Southern Arizona? And I kind of feel like the answer is no. And, and push back on me if you think this is the wrong take, but it really is about the moisture and that's the driver. And then all of these other things that we talk about pushes that moisture around. And, and yes, when you're sort of like on the margins of the moisture, availability, then those things matter in terms of flipping it from a positive or, 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 or above average to, to below average. But, but with the moisture there, like we're sort of locked in. And, 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 and if you agree with that take, I think that, that, that just means that it, fundamentally we need to be paying attention to when we think about like the future and we think actually about the past, trying to characterize the past, this is what we turn to. And I, I think that's an obvious statement that people are going to be rolling their eyes at that that pay attention to it, but it came home to me this year because of how much moisture has been around. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to push back a little bit on this though, because the, the main idea about characterizing monsoon, I, that's absolutely, I think it's spot on. I am still really struggling and it was even kind of prepping for today. It was like, what happened and how do we sum it up? But I, I can remember numerous previous summers and it wasn't the previous two, 19 and 20, we should never speak of again. Okay, we had very few, if any, if I can remember, two wet to rain days. And like, that's not, that's not normal. So, you know, the two wet to rain days are the moisture is present, but you don't have the other ingredients. And I, man, mon the monsoon is about baking. Like I've decided that it's about baking and the recipe is going to require some key ingredients to make good cookies. 
and you can mess with the ingredients, but if you take one of the ingredients out, it's going to taste like crap. It's not all the flour, not all the sugar. You can get different kinds of cookies every year, but if one of those key ingredients isn't there, it's going to be a bad cookie. All right, let me push back on that. Unless um, I think 2018 for Tucson might be a good analog. I just remember it being like there was a lot of moisture around and like we didn't get a lot of rain. Yeah, too much flour, uh, not enough sugar. Right, but but is that just taking too much of a myopic or particular place perspective? And that is to say that, okay, that's a good example of when it didn't rain in this particular area, but because there was so much moisture around, like that there was going to be rainfall quite a bit more elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So this is interesting. This is coming out in the, the work that we're doing on precip patterns in the background is that very, very heavy precip days tend to be spatially autocorrelated, right? So the more, the more, and you, but that doesn't mean that you can't have very isolated, very heavy rain in certain locations, but as you start to see a region start to experience heavy rainfall, it starts to grow as far as um, spatial autocorrelation. So very heavy rain days often carry over wide areas, right? Maybe that's sort of a truism that kind of, kind of makes sense. That doesn't mean you can have isolated, very heavy rain, but as more of those areas have isolated heavy rain, it starts to grow and encompass more of an area. So though that situation where it's too wet to rain, I mean, thinking back to some of those situations, that shuts down the low deserts. Often the upper elevations can still see precipitation during those events. So it reverts back to sort of a climatological precipitation pattern is that it precip follows elevation. But when you get the whole, like all of Arizona in play at once, that is a situation where it can't just be the moisture. You've got to have other things playing to your favor to be able to bring the low deserts as well as the upper elevations into, into play. I mean, I see the point. I, 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 obviously we've talked about this quite a bit, just all of the things that go into creating monsoon rain and how hard it is and the things have to align. And we've even talked about this in recent pods about it's not just moisture around if, if there is no moisture around game over, but if there is like you, you, you need other things to align. I guess maybe from a probabilistic or statistical perspective, you just increase your chances of having that widespread uh, rainfall when moisture is around. So you, you, you may be able to break out years, which it was too wet to rain and, and therefore the lower deserts, even though moisture was around experience lower than, lower than average or, or less, they squeezed out less moisture than you otherwise would have thought. But I bet that's less frequent during years when there is moisture around. So in other words, it's just, if there's moisture around, it's more often than not that you have a good monsoon season than, than the other stuff isn't aligning. So in other words, the moisture is the driver, if that made sense. And again, I think that's obvious. And people, again, are going to be rolling their eyes. But no, I, I don't think it's super obvious. Okay, because... Because I think that I'm pushing back on you, which pushing back on me. So I think I'm actually pushing back on myself at this point through proxy by pushing back on you is that I think you're right in the sense that location matters when we have this conversation about moisture, because the low deserts, you know, Yuma in the summertime can often be just sopping wet, you know, with enormous precipitable water, but has like almost zero chance of seeing any precipitation unless they have other factors in play, like we saw um, with some of this organized activity that happened with Nora. And that is, it's one of the key ingredients, but it's not everything. And again, I, I keep going back to my baking analogy. And I bet that, like you're saying, the recipe is a little bit different everywhere you go across the Southwest on how this works. And it's really different in New Mexico too, because of the way that they, their moisture source is, is different than ours. Is Moisture is primary because you can't have rain without moisture, but then you do need some of these other additional ingredients to really get that moisture lifted and out of the atmosphere in effective ways. It's not unlikely to have the amount of moisture around that we had this summer and that bring with it 
sort of just a ho-hum monsoon season. You, you don't think that's unlikely. I think we've seen it. I think we've seen some past summers. I'm, I'm trying to pull up the dew point data right now for Tucson in 2018, which I think rem- I remember. I mean, it was a good, it was a good monsoon, but I don't remember it being a blockbuster. The humidity was really high. What we need to do is we need to look at precipitable water. We need a scatter plot of precipitable water and then actual rainfall. Yeah, we've done this before. Ben, Ben has actually done this, yeah, done this before. That's what we, that's what we need. And we need it for like a whole bunch of sites. Yeah, we, we've done this and it's not, it's not I mean, great. Yeah, it's not, it's not very, it's not predictive. It's predictive in the sense like you get this contingency where you don't end up having, often you don't have really heavy rain with high, without high precipitable waters, but you have plenty of cases where you have high precipitable waters without rain. Yeah, I just want to see it all. Yeah, I want to see that entire scatter plot. Let's get that. Let's do that. All right, we'll do it. All right, that was cool though. I mean, I think we largely agree. And I, I think you drew out of me like, yeah, this is again another summer where you see all of these different factors and interactions and sc- scale issues, you know, like fine scale up to hemispheric scale things interacting and seeing how those things can come together and give you a crazy monsoon like we had this year, which is was been it's been something to experience. And I do agree with you here locally, it's been generational for sure. All right, so I got a second one. It's a little bit of a of a juxtaposition. It's that I've been thinking about the fragility of the monsoon. Mm. And actually something that you uh, slacked me early on in the year, early on in the monsoon season, uh, made me think about this. Uh, you know, I struggle with some of the, weather has some of the com- most complex maps and graphs. <laughs> and it's true. You have to understand like three dimensions and a lot of the graphs have a whole bunch of things going on. Anyway, so I was reading... I was reading some of these weather maps and I was trying to understand the, like there was this easterly wave and I'm like, I don't see it in this map. And you're like, oh, it's right here. And I'm like, what is that? And I'm like taking on a micro uh, magnifying glass and and seeing this small little wiggle. I'm like, oh, really? And you're like, yeah, the monsoon, like the atmosphere flow, it's so subtle. Yeah. And and just to, just to put a finer point, it probably was an inverted trough, not an easterly wave. (laughs) Just to be a little more precise. Yep. (laughs) No. And in fact, it was in that conversation because I think we were, we were, we were noting, like, I think Bob Maddox on his Mad Weather blog had a a comment about that. You're right. So, but my point is, is is you were just saying, yeah, like the, the, these features are super subtle and the monsoon is like, it doesn't, I guess on the one hand, it doesn't take much because it is so subtle. But on the other hand, there's a fr- certain fragility with that. And that, I mean, I'm, I, I'm making sort of a philosophical point, I'm st- abstracting here a, a little bit, but if it doesn't take, if there are these subtle changes that happen, that maybe would are, are much more subtle than if somebody's like, you know, in the East Coast or in Florida, for example, looking at, at, the, at the weather, or even in like the Central Plains, like they'd be like, oh, like that doesn't look like much but yet it's what we rely on here for the monsoon season to actually be triggered. So I don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts on that. No, no, you're right on, like- man. It, you, this is, it's great. It's the tropics, right? The tropics end up having very, very subtle features that can turn into clusters of storms that organize themselves into their own self-sustaining things. You know, that that's like, that's an extreme example of, you know, a, a depression turning into a, you know, a tropical storm into a hurricane and, and then back down again. The event that we had in July was pretty interesting because that, that feature was not subtle at all. I don't know if you remember this, but it was like a giant, clo- almost closed low that formed over the Great Plains and then reverse direction that came at us. So it was like, it was the best thing you could have from a forecasting standpoint because you could see it coming and it had this organizing feature. And, you know, what it did for the Southwest was create days and waves of precipitation, right? It's where you get into that murky middle ground, like you were pointing out, where you are in easterly flow and the upstream is environment is moist, so it's not importing dry air. And you're looking for the wiggles that are often occurring between balloon soundings. You know, that's the way we sample the upper atmosphere. So the models actually have to 
figure out what's in between these. And we, have, we use satellites now. We can look for the little circulations on satellites, and that can help initialize the models. You hope you get all that right, and then you roll that thing forward on the models to see if it's actually going to interact with the timing of the moisture and the convection that's already here and all that stuff. And it's just, to me, what it reinforces is how hard forecasting is with the monsoon. And like, how do we ever get to something past a week with the monsoon? Maybe it's just not possible. And then you scale it up. It's like, how do we actually ever do seasonal forecasting of the monsoon? Yeah. The modeling question, I, I, I want to have that conversation because I paid more attention to the, the models this year than I ever had. I, maybe we can save that for, for, for next podcast, but I'm curious, you, there's two ways to interpret what I said, like, I mean, fragility is one side, but there's also resilience on the other side. And if there is like, like these mo subtle monsoon features, I mean, it can be, it can characterize the fragility of it, which might mean that it's easy to shut down, but it also might, the, the flip side of that, the resilient side of that is that it doesn't take much for it to get going. And I'm just curious, do you have a particular stance on, on whether or not you think the, A, the monsoon is subtle and B, whether or not you think that means it's, it's fragile or that it's resilient? It's a good deep question. I think overall the monsoon, it's pretty resilient, but you have to take that with a grain of salt in the sense that it's resilient in the sense that the topography drives most of the, the seasonal precipitation. And so that, you know, on average through most monsoon seasons, you're going to see this gradient it will rain at the tops of mountains and it will probably rain less in the valleys and it'll be really dry in the lowest parts. Right. It's, I think what you're kind of get driving at is that to get these kinds of monsoon events where you get, it's raining everywhere, regardless of topography, that's different. And that requires convergence of a lot of other factors that you just don't see every year. Yeah. So that, that's a little more fragile. Like if you're trying to make a, a prediction a hundred years in the future, five years in the future, like is Hila Ben going to flood more or less? Oh man, I don't know. Yeah. I think the, the, the fragile narrative, I think you can spin it both ways. And I think the fragile narrative comes into it actually aligns with this idea that we've been talking about, about how many ingredients, how many things have to come together. And consequently, you know, we get, you know, on average, you know, here in Tucson, something like one rain day out of, out of, out of four. So yeah, it's hard to rain. And then, yeah, the, 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 the resilient side of things, I, I guess would be just what you said. It's, it's like, it's hard to envision given the, the monsoon mechanisms that there is a, uh, a future where there, there isn't a monsoon. So I think you can flip it both ways, but I'm going to continue to think about that. No, it's a, it's a good thought. And I think that this actually goes back to your previous one too, is that atmospheric moisture is increasing in the atmosphere. That's a, that's a climate change attribute that we know is a hap happening. And if it's a moisture limited system, this is not a first order, like I'm not making a forecast that it's going to get wetter, but it, it does suggest that you know what? It's not a. We're not limiting one of the primary ingredients, the monsoon. We're actually increasing it, right? So, so does that lean some way in the future? I don't know. It's like we'd have to have some of those other factors really shift in an opposite direction to really fight against that increasing moisture because it is. It's about moisture, like you said earlier. All right, Mike. We got to turn to the final part here, which is, you know, we are now in the waning weeks of the monsoon uh conventionally it uh it's defined as ending in, at the end of september so we've got three more weeks left of the monsoon but is the monsoon over yes it certainly feels like the monsoon's over to me yeah it's over well you said that so definitively i know i just wanted to cut to the chase i think it's i think it's over okay so why do you think it's over this is both observational and using forecast information as well. And we are seeing the, um, the broad ridge is actually, I was looking at the weather maps today and it's in a really pretty good <laughs> monsoony kind of spot right now, but the moisture is really starting to retreat uh, back to the South. And we even have a tropical storm trying to sling a slug of moisture our way right here. We're now fighting shortening days 
you know, increasing activity to the north with the normal sort of progression of the mid-latitude westerlies coming back into the um, western U.S. And so it's, I just don't see us running into a, the ridge, building back north, getting into deep easterly flow and seeing that sort of typical monsoon pattern. You know, if we do see more precip towards the end of the month, it'll be transition type activity. And that would be our, probably our best shot at that precipitation. Meaning, meaning it's not moisture from, it's, it's moisture being wafted in from the north or the west. No, it'd be from the south again, It'll, but it'll be because there's an approaching trough. So it's not because we're under that reversal of wind direction. That's kind of the hallmark of the monsoon ridge building north. It's because we're now funneling it in from the south due to an approaching trough. It's a transition. That's why we call it a transition is usually you see it at the beginning of the season as you're transitioning in and you see it at the end of the season as you're transitioning out. And what, it's, what ends up happening is the whole monsoon tropical air mass is drawn north at the beginning of the season. And if we're lucky, you hold on to it, which we did in a, in a solid way, and it'll retreat back to the south as we get more into the westerly wind. Would you call that a monsoon? Would you, yeah. would you, would you tally if, you know, we didn't have this convention of September, would you, would you label it as part oh, of Oh man, we're going to do that again. <laughs> doing that for 10 years. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a lumper rather than a splitter. Yeah. I, I like the idea of um, throwing it, throwing it into the, into the point total, even if it's a little bit weird towards the end. But, but offline, you said to a high degree of certainty, a crimmins confidence in a high, a tight crimmins confidence interval that we're not going to get any rain. You didn't think we were going to get any rain for the rest of the month. You know, what's coloring my um, thinking is my 1955 analog, which is, which is like a single forecasting point of using a past uh, analog. So Olaf is a tropical storm that you just mentioned. It's sort yeah. of at the south of Baja. It's likely going to drive some moisture up uh, into the low deserts. Is that not going to generate any potential activity? Well, I'm looking at the forecast right now <laughs> to try to try to see if I could back up. It doesn't doesn't seem like it's going to do a whole lot. It just seems like the flow pattern at this point is not favorable to to put deep moisture uh, into the southwest. We've already really dried out. And what's interesting too is that there's a lot of dry air upstream right now. So the ridge position is actually helping bring dry air in from the east. That's a problem in a lot of monsoons, even in the middle of the monsoon with a good ridge, ridge position. If there is dry air to the east, that, that is, that is can be also shut. That can also shut things down. Um, yeah. And like the six to 10 and, and eight to 14 precipitation outlooks uh, are also calling for sort of elevated chances for below, below average conditions. So, yeah. And, and that's, that's because if you look at the, the composite, the composite upper, uh, composite weather map that they use for that forecast is it shows the subtropical, it's just, it shows it's fall, right? I mean, it shows that the, the 500 millibar height pattern is, is retreating. And there's actually a broad trough across the West by the end of the month. That's, that's game over, man. That's fall. And you know what? I'm kind of looking forward to it. That sounds kind of <laughs> nice. It was a good run. It was great. This is fantastic. I mean, if you're going to do a monsoon, okay. Like my little recap here is if you're going to do a monsoon, you do it like you did this year with a bunch of hustle in July, do some fancy stuff in August, and then you're good, right? Like I don't necessarily need a tropical storm that drops six inches in September to make it. A you good know what monsoon. I want though, Mike, I want the capstone for this monsoon. I want the record. You want it, man. I mean, it's still in play. I mean, like, Come on, we need an inch and a half. I'm not asking for a lot here. You know, I, maybe like I told you, I told you it would be a half court. It's going to be a half court throw at this point. Like that's that's what shot. I that's what I feel like. It's it's, it's still in play like. right oh, now. Oh yeah, it's like, still in play. We're going to go down at the very least the third wettest on record, and you'd have to go back to sixty to fit to sixty four to have a yep. wetter wetter monsoon. So that's a long time before I was born. So. I'll take it. You know, you got to play with this idea in your head is like, if we, what, what if next summer we get 
seven inches of rain, which is above average. Well, what are we going to talk about? It's right. going to be so like, kind of like, yeah, that's interesting. Middle of the road, ho hum. Right? Yeah, I know. We just, like, we're back, <laughs> back to back, like extremes. I mean, this is the thing that as much as we hated last year, it was extreme. Yeah. And, and it's been extreme on the positive side, at least yeah. in terms of talking about it yeah. this year. I mean, listen, every single month, there's something going on. You oh, know? it'll be, it's, it's, yeah, no, no, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of exhausted, quite honestly. Like, I, it'll be cool to see like this thing. It'd be great. If we got another, if we got an average monsoon and everybody did okay next summer, I would, I'd be really pleased with that. If we followed your, both your prediction and your preference and got no rain, our own Ben McMahon would win the monsoon fantasy bet because his cynicism and his game theory approach to the monsoon fantasy had him go like on the low end for September, just so he could be in the running. Oh. But I have to mention, I know, and I'll, I'll let everybody know though, that we're not taking, um, and then you don't get, uh, you don't get the weather station uh, if, if you do win. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we stated we stated that in the beginning that we weren't taking we weren't taking uh, the prizes for it. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to you. But oh, the two man. there were two people ahead of others for July and August, uh, and that is I, I don't know their names. I know their handles. Royal Skipper, and I actually don't know how to say this. Looks like um, the second one as me Grace, which is all one word, so it's E S M E. Grace. Royal Skipper had 24 points and I can't make a word out of this. So it's got to be an abbreviation for a first, middle and last name or a first and last name um, had 21 points. So uh, they're not polling very well, given the state of September's rainfall. But hey, you know, uh, it's not over. And uh, El Paso and Albuquerque and Flagstaff uh, and can cannot hit your prediction, Mike. Even if Tucson does, I'm at one thirteen on on the the full full leaderboard. So one thirteen position one hundred thirteen. Yeah, I, yeah actually one hundred nine for total. So the game has it. It sort of accounts for your your potential September points. So is is that with your potential September points? Your one thirteen. Yeah. Oh boy, you're really bad. I'm terrible, man. Terrible. See what climatology gets you. It's kind of useless as a forecasting tool. In an except for most year, of the time. In an extreme year. It's <laughs> so uh, yeah, and we're we're looking forward to crowding the the top two finishers. It's gonna be awesome. All right, Mike. Any any final parting shots? No. This. I mean, we'll do the monsoon recap next time, and then we gotta we gotta turn our attention to La Nina and. Uh, and next winter. We also said we'd do a deep dive into the water situation because, you know, that was a couple of months ago that the Bureau of Reclamation report came out for the shortage on the, on the Colorado River, which generated a ton of, of news. We, so we should probably follow up on that. Yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, we got to do the monsoon recap. Maybe, maybe it'll be quick if it follows your sort of thinking it, it, it should be a relatively quick recap because I think we did a thorough deep dive the last two pods. Yeah, there won't be probably a lot to report. We can just kind of wrap it up. You know, I say this and then we're going to end up having Tropical Storm Zelda like roll right up into uh, southern Arizona and then cross over into New Mexico on September 29th. Well, just one will give us a record, man. I know, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for wasting uh, the last hour with us. <laughs> thanks, Zach. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Crazy we've done this for 10 years. What episode number are we? There's 98 episodes on Apple Podcasts right now. Next one will be the centennial. 100th episode. And it's the monsoon recap, so that, that lands nicely. We should make it our last one, too. Go out on a high point. It's either that or the 200. <laughs> All right, let's shoot for 200. That sounds good. I'll have to kick us off.